Did Prince Harry and Meghan Markle really get into a car chase? What is Travis Scott's reaction to Kylie Jenner dating Timothy Chalamet? And why was Brie Larson getting uncomfortable when she was asked about Johnny Depp? Stick with me guys, I'm going to answer all the questions in this video. First up, it was reported that Harry, Meghan and her mother Doria were involved in a near catastrophic car chase after being followed by paparazzi. The chase allegedly took place after Meghan and Harry had attended an awards ceremony in New York. Their spokesperson released a statement saying, last night the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and Miss Raglan were involved in a near catastrophic car chase at the hands of a ring of highly aggressive paparazzi. This relentless pursuit lasted over two hours and it resulted in multiple near collisions involving other drivers on the road, pedestrians and two police officers. While being a public figure comes with a level of interest from the public, it should never come at the cost of anyone's safety. They finished off the statement by saying that the dissemination of these pictures, given the way they were obtained, encourages a highly intrusive practice that is dangerous to all involved. This shocking news comes after Harry and Meghan were attending the Miss Foundation for Women's 2023 Women of Vision Awards. It was the couple's first public appearance since the coronation of King Charles. In her speech, Meghan encouraged women to fight for equity as she accepted the award. Of course, there is bound to be a heightened level of attention when royals are out at public events. But in this case, Meghan and Harry were said to have exited and entered the venue publicly and then paparazzi got their pictures. There are fears that the chase could have been fatal. Apparently it involved half a dozen blacked out vehicles with unidentified people driving recklessly around them. They were putting themselves and everyone else in danger. The paparazzi were said to be driving on the sidewalk, running red lights, reversing down a one way street, driving while on the phone and driving while taking pictures. Some of them even illegally blocked a moving vehicle. Apparently the people involved were confronted by uniformed police multiple times and they still sped off to continue pursuing Meghan and Harry. The family was staying at a private residence at the time and they didn't want to compromise the security of their friend's house. So they were desperately trying to lose them in the chase before they could go back home. A source told page six that the incident narrowly avoided turning into a fatal disaster when one camera person hit a car while another one almost ran over a police officer. Quote, it started off with 12 paparazzi then ended up with four chasing Megan, Harry and Doria. Everyone is still upset to say the least. It was horrific. This news is particularly shocking given that Harry's mother, Princess Diana, died in a car crash in 1997. As we know, it was speculated at the time that the crash was a result of a chase by paparazzi. Over the years, she was a topic of fascination and scrutiny for the British tabloids. And sadly, she was still being hounded by paparazzi in the moments before her death. In March of 2020, Harry and Meghan stepped away from their royal roles and moved to the US all in an effort to avoid media harassment. But the public interest in them only seemed to heighten. That October, a US news agency sent drones over to their property all to try and capture pictures of of their son Archie. The couple then launched legal action against the agency, claiming that someone had been taking intrusive and illegal pictures of their son, who was only 14 months old at the time. They eventually received an apology, but they were still forced to build a fence around their home to try and prevent that kind of thing from happening again. It might have also had something to do with the fact that their security team was taken away when they left the UK. This became a major issue when Harry went back home for the King's coronation, because the British government did not allow him to pay for his own police protection. They claim that wealthy individuals should not be able to buy specially trained officers as private bodyguards. Harry offered to pay for the protection himself, which authorities refused. So he's now seeking a review of that decision and claiming that it was unlawful. Meanwhile, he's also involved in a separate lawsuit in another high courtroom where he is suing Mirror Group newspapers over allegations of phone hacking. He's also currently suing the publisher of the Mail for Libel over an article that claimed he offered to pay for police protection after the start of his legal case against the British government. So Harry's got a ton of legal battles going on at the moment. All right, now Travis Scott has just reacted to Kylie Jenner's relationship with Timothy Chalamet. And as you can probably guess, he's not too happy about it. A source spoke to Entertainment Tonight and said, Travis is not thrilled about Kylie moving on, but they are still cordial and focused on co-parenting and being the best parents they can be. He really makes Kylie and his family a top priority and is always going above and beyond as a dad. So it sounds like Travis is not too impressed with her new relationship, but instead, he's going to try and stay focused on the kids. Fans completely lost it last month when Kylie and Timothy were confirmed to be dating. At the time, a source spoke to ET and insisted that the two of them are together, but they want to keep things private for the time being. They said, Kylie and Timothy are casually seeing each other, but are trying to keep it low key. They are becoming more comfortable with each other. Kylie wants to take things day by day and see where it goes. Her family thinks it's great that she's doing her thing and they are supportive. They went on to say, Timothy loves that Kylie is such a hands-on mom and a boss. He 
appreciates her confidence and thinks she's incredibly beautiful. Well, neither of them have said anything about their relationship themselves or shared hints on social media, but it's been said that they met through Kylie's older sister, Kendall. Last month, both of them were at Coachella, but they still managed to stay under the radar. At the time, it was said that they weren't ready to make things public just yet because Kylie really just wanted to chill and have fun with her friends. But even though they haven't gone public, they have certainly left a lot of clues that they are together. A few weeks ago, Kylie's black Range Rover was spotted in the driveway of his home, and a video was taken of them chatting at a fashion show in January. Even back then, they already seemed to be pretty familiar with each other because they were smiling and laughing together for quite a while. When video of them flirting made its way around social media, it seemed like everyone was surprised that they even knew each other. More than anything else, a lot of people just didn't understand what they could possibly have in common. Two months later, they attended the Vanity Fair Oscars party, but they weren't photographed together, most likely to avoid any more gossip around their love life. And of course, now everyone's talking about it. One person tweeted, Timothy dating Kylie feels like two timelines colliding because he reminds me of a Renaissance sculpture and she reminds me of a 2016 duck face. Another person wrote, Kylie Jenner and Timothy Chalamet dating feels the same as when two people from your high school that never interacted start dating like six years after graduation. But all jokes aside, there's also another big reason why people are surprised at the new couple. Despite the fact that Timothy has dated a number of high profile women, questions about his sexuality continue to plague him. This is largely because of his breakout role in Call Me By Your Name, where he played a gay character. His love interest was played by Army Hammer, who is himself another straight actor. The movie was a critical success and a box office hit, although it did receive a bit of criticism for casting two seemingly straight actors in queer roles. Even though his performance was an absolute knockout, unfortunately, these rumors bled into his love life as well. Timothy dated Lily Rose Depp from 2018 to 2020, but it wasn't all smooth sailing. One particular makeout session was caught by paparazzi in Italy, and people's reaction to it really affected the way he felt about their relationship. Fans made fun of his appearance and wrote horrible things about him, accusing their whole relationship of being a PR stunt. So realistically, Timothy just hasn't been able to catch a break no matter who he's dating. As for Kylie, her love life has been nothing but Travis Scott since they got together in 2017. They have two kids together, their daughter Stormy and their son Air. They broke up for the second time this past December, just two years after they got back together during the pandemic. At the time, a source told Us Weekly, Kylie and Travis are off again on again. They were supposed to spend the holidays together, but she ended up going to Aspen for the new year to join her sister Kendall, along with a few close friends, like Hailey and Justin Bieber. They've had a rocky relationship for quite some time, but they've since insisted that they will always remain friends and co-parents. For a while, it seemed like they were going to get back together. Travis recently left a sweet comment under one of her Instagram photos and called her beautiful. Fans thought this was pretty interesting given that he rarely comments on her photos, but it was probably just wishful thinking on his part because right now, things with Timothy are well and truly on. Moving on, did you hear that awkward question Brie Larson just got asked about Johnny Depp? She was left completely stunned after she got singled out by a member of the press. They wanted to hear her thoughts on Johnny Depp's controversial film opening at the Cannes Film Festival. During a Tuesday press conference, the actress was asked how she felt about his film Jean du Barry and whether or not she planned on seeing it. She was clearly taken aback and responded with a lot of confusion. Brie said, you're asking me that? I'm sorry, I don't understand the correlation or why me specifically. The reporter then brought up the fact that she was a part of the Time's Up movement, so that's why he was asking her. In response, she said, understood. Well, see, I guess if I see it, I don't know how I feel about it until I do. Even though that moment was incredibly uncomfortable to watch, Brie was commended for her excellent response to such a contentious question. In fact, some people even suggested that the journalist was being unprofessional for even asking her something like that. Because it just sounds like a question that was intended to set her up to twist her words, which is what you would call a gotcha question. One person tweeted, Brie Larson was a victim of one of the most degenerate and violent misogynistic hate campaigns on the internet, and I cannot blame her for not wanting to subject herself to that again. Another person wrote, Brie Larson herself has been and is still a victim of an insane misogynistic campaign, so I actually get why she would choose to be vague and evasive with her answers, because whatever she says, on top of what she already experiences, especially online, she's not going to win. Less than a year has passed Past since all the gritty details of Johnny Depp's relationship with Amber Heard was aired in open court. The six week trial became a cultural phenomenon that many people felt was a kind of pushback to the Me Too movement. So the decision to invite him to the festival was no doubt controversial, and it even led to the hashtag CansyNot trending on social media. At a news conference on Wednesday, Depp addressed the idea that some people think he shouldn't have been there. In response, he said, What if one day they did not allow me, under no circumstances, no matter what, I cannot go to McDonald's for life? 
because somewhere if you got all of them in one room there would be 39 angry people watching me eat a Big Mac on a loop just for fun. Who are they? Why do they care? At another point he claimed that he doesn't feel boycotted by Hollywood because he doesn't think about Hollywood or need it. His film Jean du Barry marks his first return to the big screen since the defamation trial last year. Depp arrived at the festival to a very warm reception with smiles and cheers from the crowd. He signed autographs and took selfies with fans before the premiere. Along with Mei Buen, the two of them entered the theatre hand in hand and they received a standing ovation. At one point, Depp winked at the cameraman who zoomed in on his face, and the crowd responded with even more cheers. Although his presence at the festival was celebrated, the actual movie itself received a lukewarm review. Variety's Peter Debruge said, Depp delivers his lines in well-turned French, wearing fine powder and a stiff white wig, yet seems so strangely uncomfortable in the role. Adequate, but not especially engaged. He felt there was a distinct lack of chemistry between the two leads. Raffaella Sales Ross from the playlist described Depp as very American and very misplaced in the film, where his French accent is almost as distracting as his distorted makeup. So would you still watch the movie just to see Johnny Depp back in action, or would you rather skip this one and wait for his next project? Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about the fact that fans are criticizing Johnny Depp's teeth. The taxi driver who drove Meghan and Harry is now calling them out, and Beyonce's mum was almost trampled at her concert. Alright, so we already knew that the internet was a cruel place, but this takes it to a new level. On Tuesday, Johnny Depp was at the Cannes Film Festival for the premiere of his new film Jean du Barry. While a lot of people celebrated his return to the festival, others couldn't help dragging his appearance, specifically his teeth, which appeared to be orange or brown in colour. Some people on Twitter had been making fun of close-up photos of his teeth, calling them disgusting. These photos were followed up with some pretty nasty comments, some saying that he looked like he had eaten a bag of charcoal. One person wrote, very very inspired to brush my teeth, floss and use a tongue scraper every time I see a pic of Johnny Depp at Cairns. Another person wrote, Johnny Depp's teeth appeared to be rotting, and he appears to have forgotten to brush his teeth this morning. Others questioned if the photos were fake, leaving comments like, is this real or an edit? But there were also those people coming to his defense. One person said, if Johnny Depp doesn't want fake ultra white teeth, he doesn't need them. I have seen a lot worse as well. Although these red carpet photos might be a little shocking, his teeth have actually been a source of speculation for years. As people rushed to try to get to the bottom of how this happened, one person discovered an interview from 1995 in Premier Magazine, where he explained that this has been a long-standing issue for him. At the time, he said, I've got loads of cavities. I had a root canal done eight years ago that's unfinished. It's like a rotten little stub, but I like it. I'm proud of these. When I see people with perfect teeth, it drives me up the wall. I'd rather swallow a tick than have that. Unlike many Hollywood stars, Johnny Depp hasn't spent thousands of dollars to get pearly white veneers or expensive composite bonding. Besides, he's also known for transforming his smile depending on the role that he plays. For Pirates of the Caribbean, he had extensive gold capping of his teeth, and he held onto those caps until filming closed on the third installment of the franchise. Johnny has also admitted to struggling with substance and alcohol addiction, and some people think his poor dental health might be a result of that. He more or less confirmed this in a 2016 interview when he said that he has been neglecting his teeth for years, and that he was working to get them fixed. But he's also said that he's not ashamed of his appearance, and that he is comfortable in his own skin. The actor has been in the public eye for decades, so fans have come to know and love his look. And it sounds like Dior likes it too, because he recently signed a $20 million three-year deal to continue to be the face of Dior Sauvage, which is a fragrance that he's been the spokesperson for since 2015. Apart from the hateful comments, Johnny has received a very warm welcome at Cannes, a seven-minute standing ovation to be exact. He spoke at the press conference of Jean du Barry, which he was more than 40 minutes late for, but not only about the film, but his future in mainstream filmmaking. And unfortunately for his fans, it doesn't sound like he's going to be returning to big blockbusters anytime soon. He said that he doesn't feel boycotted by Hollywood because he doesn't think about it. Quote, I don't have much further need for Hollywood myself. It's a very strange and funny time when everyone would love to be able to be themselves, but they can't because they must fall in line with the person in front of them. You want to live that kind of life? I wish you the best. I'll be on the other side somewhere. In that same press conference, he was also asked about the idea that some people thought he shouldn't have been there. In response, he compared getting boycotted by Hollywood Hollywood to being banned from McDonald's, and said that his haters amount to 39 angry people behind a computer screen. His response brought about laughs from the audience because he was basically saying that he didn't think about the backlash anymore. When Depp was asked about his career comeback, he didn't seem too focused on that either. He said, I've had about 17 comebacks apparently. I keep wondering about the word comeback, because they didn't go anywhere. As a matter of fact, I live about 40 
25 minutes away. So he clearly just wants to keep working and not have it labeled as anything more than that. All right, now if you've been keeping up with Meghan Markle and Prince Harry's paparazzi car chase story, you have to listen to this. The cab driver who was taking them across New York City in this supposed high speed car chase has now called them out. The driver who was being referred to as Mr. Singh was with the couple for 10 minutes on Tuesday night when they were coming back from an award ceremony. He told the BBC that he picked them up at a local police precinct in Midtown Manhattan. Harry and Meghan's spokesperson described what happened as a relentless pursuit that lasted more than two hours. But the driver didn't exactly describe the incident that same way. When he was asked about the couple's statement, he said, I don't think that's true. I think that's all exaggerated and stuff like that. Don't read too much into that. He claimed that the paparazzi were not being aggressive during the drive and they stayed behind and kept their distance. He said that if they were being chased in that way, it must have happened before they got in his taxi. Mr. Singh never felt that they were in danger. He explained that New York City is the safest place to be because there's police stations, cops on every corner, and there's just no reason to be afraid in the city. To be fair though, he did also describe Harry and Meghan as nice people and said that they looked nervous because they might have been chased the whole day. He also got a pretty decent tip from their security guard, which was $50 for a 10 minute drive. So that doesn't sound too bad. The chase apparently took place after the couple attended that award ceremony. Their spokesperson released a statement saying, last night the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and Miss Raglan were involved in a near catastrophic car chase at the hands of a ring of highly aggressive paparazzi. This relentless pursuit lasted over two hours, resulted in multiple near collisions involving other drivers on the road, pedestrians, and two police officers. While being a public figure comes with a level of interest from the public, it should never come at the cost of anyone's safety. Meghan and Harry claimed that they were followed by more than six blacked out vehicles that were driving recklessly around them. The paparazzi were said to be driving on the sidewalk, running red lights, reversing down a one-way street, driving while on the phone, driving while taking pictures, and even illegally blocking a moving vehicle. But one of the paparazzi drivers involved in the car chase claimed that it was actually Meghan and Harry's taxi driver who was the one being reckless. He spoke anonymously to ITV's Good Morning Britain and said that it was very tense trying to keep up with their car because they did a lot of blocking and different types of maneuvers to try to stop what was happening. He said if it was dangerous and catastrophic, he was more likely based on the person that was driving. Then the photo agency who received the photos also spoke out. They claimed that three of the paparazzi were in cars and one of them was riding a bicycle. They insisted that there was no near collisions or near crashes during the incident. Quote, it is important to note that these photographers have a professional responsibility to cover newsworthy events and personalities, including public figures such as Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And while this was happening, New York police confirmed that some type of chase did occur and they said that the photographers made their transport challenging, although they insisted that there was no reported collisions or injuries. Whoopi Goldberg then weighed in on the story and called BS on the couple's version of events. She said, their spokesperson called it a near catastrophic car chase. Others said it wasn't bad, but I think people in New York know that if it was possible to have car chases in New York, we'd all make it to the theater on time. She said that this kind of car chase would be a lot more likely to happen in a city like LA. Whoopi agreed that they were probably dealing with aggressive paparazzi, but she thinks their story is a bit of an exaggeration. On the other hand, Sunny Hostin pushed back and said that Meghan and Harry never claimed it was a high speed chase, just that it was near catastrophic. She also pointed out the fact that Harry's mother, Princess Diana, died in a car crash involving paparazzi. So if they felt scared in that kind of situation, it would have made sense. But a lot of people don't like these constant comparisons to Diana, and Meghan Kelly is one of them, and said, let's face it, Harry's been trying to make Meghan into Diana from the moment they started dating. The news anchor also felt that they were grossly exaggerating when they described the story. According to Kelly, near catastrophic could mean anything. It could mean looking down to change the radio while they were driving or checking their phones. She then posted a tweet saying, I've lived in Manhattan for 17 years and it is not possible to have a two hour car chase there. Too many street lights slash stop signs, too much foot slash car traffic, and hundreds of places you could safely pull over to protect yourself. So what do you guys think really happened? Let me know in the comments below. And now let's talk about the fact that Beyonce's mom was almost crushed at her concert in Belgium. Paramedics had to come in and rescue Tina Knowles from a packed section of the audience called Club Renaissance, which is an exclusive floor space occupied by top tier ticket holders. Beyonce's mom seemed to be getting almost trampled in the crowd, so she was hoisted out of that section by one medic and two fans assisting with the lift. The whole thing was posted on TikTok and it was really crazy to see because it was just so chaotic. In the video, Tina looks around nervously for a way to get over the barricade. She's clearly stressed out and is trying to find the best way 
to leave. She then decides that being picked up is the best way to escape. Six paramedics then clustered around her as she was boosted out of the section. Once she gets placed on the ground, she signals to medics that she's fine. And the best part of this is that Tina was kindly waving to her fans and saying sorry for the inconvenience. She even shakes someone's hand before walking away. So while she probably thinks that she disrupted the concert, she actually elevated the whole experience to an unexpected meet and greet. The comments under that video are hilarious. One person wrote, wait, why was Tina even in the trenches? In response, someone explained that she was with security, but eventually got lost and somehow ended up in that section. And she was probably feeling overwhelmed. Beyonce's much anticipated Renaissance tour kicked off this month and she's currently in the UK. Fans who got to see the opening night told BBC Newsbeat that it was the most expensive show and the craziest show that they've ever seen in their life. From a giant shiny horse to multiple costume changes, it's said to be one spectacular show. Maybe her best yet. It's almost three hours long and the staging is exactly as extravagant as you're imagining. So it's no surprise that it's sold out almost immediately. The tour showcases her Grammy Award winning Renaissance album, but of course it also includes some of her classics. Beyonce did her first live performance of Dangerously in Love in 10 years. The 36 song set list still features albums like Crazy in Love, I Am, Sasha Fierce and Drunk in Love. Beyonce hasn't released any new music videos for Renaissance, so the tour is the first chance for fans to explore the tracks with a visual element. So far the reviews say everything about what to expect. The Guardian gave the show a 5 star rating, while Rolling Stone said Beyonce makes breezing through her back catalog and costume changes look easy, as everyone else is left to keep up. The tour is her first time on the road solo since 2016, so of course demand for tickets was sky high. But as we know now, it was more than worth it. Renaissance celebrates black and queer dance culture, and fans said that equality was a big theme on night one. So much so that Beyonce reportedly made the decision to make some bathrooms at the venue gender neutral. And as you might expect, the fashion was also incredible. It's all very disco themed, and Beyonce is performing in things like glittering catsuits and metallic corsets. But don't worry if you can't make it to the show, because social media can help you experience a small part of it from home. So just make sure that you stay online if you want to catch the coolest parts of the performance. That's all for this one. Let me know what you guys think about the story, and I'll catch you in the next video. Was the near catastrophic car crash involving Meghan and Harry faked? Seems like there's a bit of evidence popping up that might prove that it was. Hey guys, I'm your host Lauren, and today we're going to be counting down the top 10 signs that Meghan and Harry's car chase never really happened. Let's get into it. Number 10, we have the New York Police Department. The alleged car chase happened when Harry and Meghan were leaving an event in Manhattan. The event was Miss Foundation Woman of Vision Awards, where Meghan was being honored as one of the year's women of vision. The couple and Meghan's mother claimed to have been relentlessly pursued after leaving the event with their driver, who drove them in an SUV. But if the chase was as near catastrophic and highly aggressive as the couple has claimed, then where was the police involvement? Reportedly, the whole situation was two hours and had many near collisions with drivers, pedestrians, and two police officers. Just recently, the New York Times reported that the NYPD concluded that the incident requires no further investigation. In their statement, they basically indicated that they aren't believing the claims of how bad it was, and reportedly said that they believe no one broke any laws. Police officials have acknowledged that the car chase did become chaotic, and went on to say, numerous photographers made their transport challenging, and added, there were no reported collisions, summons, injuries, injuries or arrests. An anonymous law enforcement source even had some opinions on the whole thing, saying they should have just gotten to a hotel for the safety of everyone. Instead, they were cheap and wanted a free place to stay. Going on to tell Page Six, if they had just paid up and got a hotel, this supposed dangerous paparazzi chase would have never happened. The source explained that the situation would have looked like, adding, they would have driven back to the Carlisle, been photographed going inside, and that would have been the end of it. Number 9. Photo and Video Evidence the the lack of direct evidence has many confused. If there were as many photographers chasing them as there is claimed to be, then where are the photos and videos, and where are witness photos? Typically in high profile events like this, there is at least something that would find its way to social platforms. But for this incident, there is seemingly very little. Harry and Meghan have looked to want to get a hold of any photos first though. The couple's legal team sent a letter to a photo agency that snapped the photos, back grid, and said, immediately provide us with the copies of all photos, videos, and films. Backgrid responded with its own letter, saying, In America, as I'm sure you know, property belongs to the owner. Third parties can't just demand it to be given to them, as perhaps kings can do. The shade really doesn't go unnoticed. The photo agency didn't stop there, though, and stood by the photographers. In a statement released regarding
regarding the incident, they said they had no intention of causing any distress or harm, as their only tool was their cameras. A few of the photos even show Meghan Markle smiling in the cab. Could this be why Harry and Meghan wanted to get a hold of the photos first? Number 8. Witnesses Seems like many witnesses don't feel the car chase was quite as dramatic as Harry and Meghan and their team are making it out to be. A photographer who was on the scene at the time told People that it is sensational to even describe the car chase as near catastrophic. The photographer said, Nobody got a ticket or arrested. I don't see how it was near catastrophic other than a crazy hyperbole. Another source added, At any point, they could have gone to a police station or pulled into a garage. The photo agency Backgrid even claimed that it was Harry and Meghan's security escort who was driving erratically. They said, The photographers report that one of the four SUVs from Prince Harry's escort was driving in a manner that could be received as reckless. Going on to say, the vehicle was seen blocking off streets, and in one video it is shown being pulled over by the police. We do want to point out that according to photographers present, there were no near collisions or near crashes during the incident. Harry and Meghan have also claimed that the ordeal was two hours long as they were chased throughout the city, but a high-ranking source just doesn't agree. They revealed there were no collision reports or 911 calls, and the chase definitely wasn't two hours. Number 7. Security Lawsuit Could the the timing of the situation just be a little too coincidental. Harry has had various problems over the years with security and the media, but more recently he has been in a legal battle for permission to pay for his own police protection in the UK. Harry sued the UK Home Office for a ruling that private individuals who have been denied police bodyguards should not be allowed to pay for them to be reinstated. Harry was stripped of his taxpayer funded security when he decided to quit as a working royal back in 2020 and has been looking to get this reinstated ever since. But could this denial of paying for police protection force Harry and Meghan to feel that they had to prove they needed it with the car chase? The timing of this paparazzi story and the filing of the lawsuit has definitely struck up some suspicions. Number 6. Diana The car chase is definitely similar to the heartbreaking story that we've heard before involving Harry's mother, Diana. Back in 1997, Diana and her boyfriend were in a black Mercedes when their driver tried to get away from a swarm of paparazzi. He hit a pillar in a tunnel and unfortunately all three individuals in the car did pass away. Harry has been outspoken about his feelings towards the photographers who caused the crash. In the documentary Diana Seven Days, Harry said, One of the hardest things to come to terms with is the fact that the people who chased her into the tunnel were the same people that were taking photographs of her while she was still passing away in the back seat of the car. Harry reportedly told his friends after the fact that this is the closest he's ever felt to understanding what his mother went through. Meghan's half-sister Samantha even has some thoughts on this and insists that Meghan has an eerie obsession with the late Prince Princess Diana. Samantha appeared on GV News after reports came out about the car chase. She said, From the stories of wearing Diana's perfume on their first date, to being seen in photographs mimicking her every move, to reportedly even channeling Diana and putting her hands on stones. I think there seems to be an obsession. Samantha went on to say, Let's not forget the lifetime drama escaping the palace, when at the end she is depicted dying similarly to how Diana did. And if that's not a little bit eerie and that's not a little bit obsessed, then please tell me what is. Samantha shared her belief that this is all in order to invoke Diana passing. She shared her speculation saying, Princess Diana is being evoked for convenience seemingly every time Harry and Meghan don't get their way or they want a PR opportunity. Number 5. New York Traffic With New York being full of traffic, it has many speculating how legitimate a full-on chase claim really is. Whoopi Goldberg made her opinions known during a segment on The View. She said, When you use that kind of verbiage, know your credibility will be cut in half because New Yorkers will say, nobody moves that fast. Going on to say, I think people know that if it was possible to have car chases in New York, we'd all be making it to the theater on time. This car chase also led TikTokers to take to their social media to show how difficult it really would be to have a car chase in New York. In one video, a TikTok user shows a typical New York street filled with traffic. One person commented, they could have gotten out of the car and ran faster. And another added, every man, woman, and child carries a phone, but no videos of this for two hours. Sure. Number 4. Switching Cars The switching of cars definitely had a few people suspicious, with many people questioning why would they leave the safety of their SUV to get into a random taxi. Reportedly, the paparazzi drove on the sidewalk, ran red lights, and drove the wrong way on a one-way street during the whole of the chase, according to TMZ. There were six vehicles allegedly following them with blacked out windows. The police ended up intervening and led them to a police station as reported by the Associate Press. After staying there for approximately 15 minutes they left in a taxi. This left a few social media users concerned as to why they would leave their car for
for a cab, rather than being escorted in their own car by police to their destination. Instead, after 10 minutes in the first cab ride, the security official that was accompanying the couple and Megan's mother asked the driver to return to the original location. But after a garbage truck blocked the path, one of the royals insisted they return to the police station. A video posted by TMZ showed the couple in a cab, stuck in traffic and being photographed. The cab was then finally escorted by the NYPD along with flashing lights to their final destination. But it does leave more questions though, because why would they need to switch cars in order to outrun the paparazzi? Why didn't they just ask the police escort in the first place? Number three, the other royals give no comment. With the event looking like it is nearly history repeating itself, many look to the palace to give a statement. But with the royals refusing to comment on anything Harry or Meghan does, it looks like this situation was no exception. When Us Weekly asked the palace for a statement, they simply responded by saying, this is not something we're commenting on. Considering how similar this event was to the 1997 car crash, many were expecting more of a reaction from the other working royals. But it looks like this will never come. One social media user commented on this and said, the palace knows that no comment is a comment. Another added saying, the decline to comment from the royal family is loud. Number two, sympathy. Another speculation that this car chase could be more exaggerated than it really was is that Harry and Meghan could be looking for sympathy, considering their mixed reviews in the media. The couple has done various interviews and Netflix specials that have shown viewers a look into their life as a modern royal. But with Harry's tell-all memoir, the couple gained a label as being a bit controversial. In the memoir, Harry claims that his brother William physically attacked him, as well as accusing his father, King Charles, of being selfish. Though a few saw this book as being informative and even humanizing the royal family, other readers thought that he was just sharing a little bit too much and not making himself look good in the process. With one reader even saying, Harry is now just as entitled as the others. With this and the fact that he just recently attended King Charles coronation solo, could the couple be exaggerating the situation in order to gain back some of their fans? Number one, the taxi driver. In order to get away from the paparazzi, Harry, Meghan, Meghan's mother, and the security personnel all hopped into a cab. So what does the cab driver who was in the chase have to say about this whole incident? Chris Sanchez, who was a member of the couple's security team, said, I have never experienced anything like this. What we were dealing with was very chaotic. There were a dozen vehicles. It could have been fatal. But it doesn't seem like the taxi driver, Mr. Singh, agrees. He shared to the Washington Post, they kept following us and they were coming next to the car. They took pictures as we were stopped and they were filming us. Going on to say, I don't think I would call it a chase. I never felt like I was in danger. It wasn't like a car chase in the movie. They were quiet and they seemed scared, but it's New York, it's safe. He revealed that the entire journey with the group only lasted about 10 minutes. Mr. Singh also explained that the paparazzi weren't being aggressive, sharing, they were behind us. I mean, they stayed on top of us, but that was pretty much it. It was nothing more. They kept their distance. Well, that's all we have for you guys today. Let us know in the comments below what you think of the car chase and if it really happened or not. And we'll see you in the next one.